Back in the licensed minefield, this time as a personal request from a member of the inner circle. Guess one of the board members wants to cause me a bit of pain, and I have been do something of dubious quality, seeing as Scooby-Doo was the last time I subjected myself to the equivalent of ripping off a hangnail. Or not, as this is a case of wandering blind, and all I have to go off of is hearsay and other people's words. You'd think a gelatinous mold vaguely shaped as a human would be up to his eyeballs and Transformers having an enjoyment of the mecha genre, but surprisingly this follows the same path as the TMNT. I have vague, fleeting memories of watching Beast Wars, Armada, and Animated. Cybernet makes its daily appearance on the show as I first saw the tie-in Armada game there, and I did play some of the video games, particularly Beast Wars Transmetals. But any greater exposure I've had to Transformers lies either in fan interpretation. All I know of Prime comes from Fred Perry, which can be shorthanded to everyone really wants to plow a motorcycle, or from other people's coverage. I would list the Michael Bay movies in this rundown, but depending on the time frame this video gets released, I would probably like to put those trite, long-winded, sorry excuses for a cinema deep in the darker recesses of my brain where they can no longer hurt me. My existence is suffering either way. While Activision published, Transformers 07, as I will be calling it forward to distinguish it from both the movie and other games under the license, was a foray by good old TT themselves. Traveler's Tales. If I had a Hall of Fame dedicated to the unsung licensed developers in the industry, they would probably be somewhere in there as most of their output is focused on developing tie-ins and other such usually forgotten titles, as most they are known nowadays for are the LEGO games, a stark contrast from their earlier work tied to Psygnosis Limited. Those older in the crowd may have a fondness for the White Owl as this once again brings us back to the British home computer boom of the 80s. Cutting down a serpentine story as Psygnosis' seeds were planted during the days of Imagine Software, see the Bubble Bursts article linked below, once that company went under and was acquired by Ocean Software, co-founders David Lawson and Mark Butler would form a sort of transitional company by the name of Finch Speed to acquire Imagine's unfinished software. Mostly two titles, Cyclaps, which would get the boot as it was stored into the vault immediately, and a little-known game by the name of Bandersnatch. What I mean by shortening the story is that Bandersnatch is its own entity. The never-finished mega games of Imagine is a treasure trove of what-ifs and speculation. The fact that David and Mark went out of their way to attempt to acquire the project says a lot. From the personal computer games magazine circa September 1984, to hold the vast size of the program, Bandersnatch, Imagine planned originally to sell it with a 64K ROM chip, more than doubling the 48K Spectrum's memory. This would have cost a fortune, and negotiations are now rumored to be underway with Sinclair to put the game out on microdrive. For a bit of running back, Sinclair, also known as Sinclair Research, wanted the unfinished Mega Games as well after Imagine went bust, ultimately winning the bidding war against Finch Speed. However, all David had to do was wait to get to work on Bandersnatch. From Home Computer Weekly number 84, the phoenix rises from the flames. Imagine is not dead. Bandersnatch, one of the much vaunted mega games, has been bought up by Sinclair Research and will be released for the QL in the new year. Dave Lawson, joint founder of Imagine, and Ian Hetherington, financial director, are heading a team of ex-Imagine staff which is working on the conversion. In steps Fire Iron, the Spike Chunsoft in the story to Imagine's human entertainment. Budgeted by Sinclair, the former Imagineers would attempt to breathe Bandersnatch to life. From Popular Computing Weekly's October 1984 issue, Bandersnatch is being completely rewritten, not just finished, said Dave Lawson. This is partly because they are now to be released on the QL rather than the Spectrum in Commodore 64. 
and partly because we have learned a lot about this particular programming technique from developing it for the other micros. Yet, like the creature is named after, Bandersnatch would remain a fiction. Sinclair withdrew funding sometime during 1985, leaving Fire Iron no reason to honor their commission. Instead, as if predicting this outcome, the heads of Fire Iron, Ian Hetherington, David Lawson, and Jonathan Ellis, submitted paperwork to form a new company, Cynosis. In fact, many of the proposed ideas for Bandersnatch would end up in this new developer's first game, Brodicus. <laughs> I see what they did there. From onward, Psygnosis would make a name for themselves with the likes of Lemmings, Wipeout, and Shadow of the Beast for the three fans of that game. This takes us to around 1989 with a man by the name of John Burton. Matching the time period and region we've mostly stuck to, we get a repeat of what happened during the history of Max Payne. The demo scene was rife with small-time developers, artists, and programmers that wanted to push the limits of hardware and hopefully make a name for themselves. As stated in a plain catch-up interview with John Burton, things really began to change after Burton bought a Commodore Amiga in the mid-80s and became interested in the system's burgeoning demo scene where programmers and artists would create flashy animated exhibitions of the computer's abilities. They were often, though not exclusively, created by hacking groups and used to introduce or book in cracked games in order to display the group's skill. It's during his days of tinkering that John would meet graphic designer Andy Ingram, the two forming a partnership and coming up with the idea for a game. While I don't know what the original end result for this idea was between the two, a quote from John in the Playing Catch-Up interview says it best. After a few months, I met up with a guy who was a freelance graphic artist, and we decided to write a game. We produced a basic first-pass level of the game and took it to Psygnosis, mainly just for some guidance. To our surprise, they offered to publish it. John was still in college at the time, but just like that, Psygnosis kickstarted the founding of Traveler's Tales. This big brother relationship would prove vital to Tales' early success, as because Psygnosis was a publishing giant, that meant they had connections. Connections to a subsidiary of Sony, Sony ImageSoft, and Disney Interactive. Having a DI classic like Mickey Mania and their own mascot platformer in 93's Pugsy, while also being familiar with the Mega Drive and its brothers and sisters, probably caught the attention of Sega as they would pick TT as a second party developer for... Well, I know some people like Sonic R, but 3D Blast is a woeful entry in the Blue Blur's library. Still, though, this was a massive boon for Tails, simply because they had been experimenting with the Saturn. In Sega Saturn Magazine issue 24, John was asked when did Sonic R become a racing game with him providing the following answer. We had just started programming a racing engine on the Saturn at the time we were approached by Sega to produce the next Sonic game. It made sense to use the engine we were writing. Coincidentally, Sonic Team did specifically ask for a racing game. Following one more release under Cynosis, Tails would form their most important bond, at least in the context of this video, sometime during 98. Activision would call upon them as a developer for a Bug's Life on consoles and PC. This is the track record for the company, as many of their subsidiaries like Neversoft and Toys for Bob had backdrops in the licensed game department. Activision always knew how to get the rights for many a product, with Transformers being no different. I don't feel the need to explore the Transformers media empire here, as I'm pretty sure cultural osmosis has us all covered. It's one of the biggest 80s toy franchises in the world and gave Peter Cullen his pivotal voice acting role as Optimus Prime, Frank Welker adding to his already exhaustive list with Megatron. It's a topic I feel out of depth to cover, and many other people have already done so in the form of documentaries like The Toys That Made Us and various interviews, analyses, what have you. To cover Transformers would need its own separate video. The one aspect I will go on to mention that ties to the overall lifespan of the series 
is that around the time of the first Michael Bay movie is that the series was in a soft slump. The last TV show for Transformers was the 2005 anime Cybertron acting as a standalone experience in its native language of Japanese while the English dub tried to connect it to the previous two shows. O2's Armada and O4's Energon. Game-wise, Transformers Armada prelude to Energon saw the light of day in 04, making it the previous game to come before 07. I would argue that it is safe to say that Michael Bay did put the Transformers back into the spotlight, as only diehards and kids really cared for collecting the toys or tuning into Cartoon Network to see Armada. We did get animated in 07 and Prime in 2010. Moving away from my own personal thought process, much of what we know about 07's development comes from the special edition of the game as it came with a making of video. Essentially, Activision and TT had much of the same access as the Collective did for Revenge of the Sith. Up to and including getting both physical actors like Shia LaBeouf and Megan Fox to voice their characters from the movie within the game, as well as Peter Cullen and the other Transformer voice actors. Not returning, however, was Hugo Weaving's Megatron. Instead, taking his role within the game was the OG, Frank Welker. This would ultimately serve as Frank's backdoor entrance into the movies, as Hugo would only voice Megatron within the first film. For perspective, Peter and Frank hadn't voiced either Optimus or Megatron since the original run of G1 Transformers, back in the late 80s. That means Transformers 07 is a reunion for the two, with G1 writer Flint Deal joining the mix as well. Design doc-wise, Activision publishers wanted to fully capture the identity of the Transformers. The three major criteria they wanted to fulfill were as such. Scale, destruction, and transformation. A boiled down, big robots should cause massive damage to landscape and change into car, or jet, or helicopter. Everything you want to do as a Transformer. Release schedule-wise, handheld versions of the game came out first on June 19th, 2007, consoles following suit on June 26th, 2007 in North America. EU, meanwhile, had all copies of the game released on July 20th, 2007. Lining up with the movie, Michael Bay's Transformers had its first showing on June 10th, 2007 in South Korea, the United States getting it a day before our independence. July 3rd, 2007. As requested by me from a member of the Inner Circle, I played through the PlayStation 2 version as that is what that member of the board played with as a child. You know, what's funny is that the game and the movie have about the same length if you cut out all the faffing about you can do in the open world. While Transformers 07 isn't a shot-for-shot -shot adaptation, it's damn well close while adding a bit more to the background, as in here's what happened potentially off-screen. Or what was basically in the original script of the movie that some higher up, probably Spielberg, stressed to Bay couldn't be in the final cut due to time constraints. On a technical level, that does mean the game is superior to the film as much of the box contained in the first Michael Bay flick are gleaned over, which is a massive positive in my books. I've slowly come to realize that there aren't any good Transformers movies by Michael Bay, just less painful ones. So instantly removing the inane scenes like Frenzy's whole contribution to the story, I dot e the ridiculous Air Force One bit, and cutting out much of the truly awful writing leaves the core of the story for the game to work with. And in that regard, the game's retelling of the plot with minor deviations causes me less suffering, I suppose. All that is really noticeable is the Decepticon campaign, as it changes the whole ending scenario during the massive city battle. The Autobots lose, and Megatron claims the throne of Abraham Lincoln like his classic G1 rendition. Of course, working on the limitations, some of the scenes that have a one-for-one -one with the movie happen in either different locations. Bumblebee protecting Sam and Michaela from Barricade happens in the residential area as opposed to the city, or change to fit gameplay, the Autobots encounter with Sector 7. I guess what I'm trying to say is that the game has less bloat and doesn't make me want to subject myself to the horrors of Euphoria as a palate cleanser, at least on a uh, written aspect. There just truly isn't much you can fuck up, seeing as the source material is the height of turn your brain off blockbuster. A 
To at least give 07 some credit, it doesn't emulate perfectly, thus the odd texture flickering and random bouts of slowdown. That's a ROM issue, which won't factor into this critique as it lies outside the context of the game. This isn't Manhunt on Steam being a bugger to get working despite the officialness of its release. Back to Transformers 07, while it definitely isn't pretty, or at least this rendition as 07 also came out on PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360, the fact that it retains much of what the higher definition versions had just in a lower resolution and graphic fidelity is something to be applauded. Nothing was cut out for this version, at least from what I could compare, so while it may look worse, that is the price to be paid being on a weaker console's hardware when other attributes could have been cut like missions or characters. got a situation. Big meteor just hit the park, and it definitely ain't one of ours. We'll need to deal with it, pronto. trying to transmit a distress signal using mobile communication vehicles. Hunt them down. Hunt them down and destroy them all. That's the overall tone with the graphics of the game, but while everything does look muddier and worse, the Transformers blocky megaliths where you can see their texture maps, they do retain some detail particularly when it comes to their inner workings. About one thing I will give to the Michael Bay Transformers is the amount of bips and bobs on his versions of the characters, which I know some find distracting, but I do like how it emphasizes how mechanical they are. And it leads to neat little details like how when in vehicle mode for the car-based Transformers, their projectile weapons shift out of parts of them like mirrors or headlights, while in robot form, you see parts of their vehicle form adapt to their robot nature like with Jazz's machine gun. While graphically the game is a bit bland, the Transformers are the stars, and not only do I think they look good even in this chunkier fidelity, 07 is backed up by having a physics engine. Someone say destructible environments and objects because 07 has this in spades. Obviously not to the degree as the greats in the medium like Red Faction, Gorilla, or Mercenaries, and it's not hitting creative levels like Metal Arms glitch in the system, I swear I'm not trying to dunk on Transformers 07, but it feels like 07 would serve as a blueprint for other games within the destructible open world genre as it transitioned to the next gen of the PS Triple and 360. 07 did come out before Guerrilla and Mercenaries 2, so it seems to me that Activision wanted a proof of concept before going on to publish Prototype. And while this is speculation on my behalf, what I will say is that where the game completely shines is in the animation department, once again highlighting the Transformers themselves as these behemoths of metal and energon.
take him out before he levels the city. Best way to describe the trademark transform and rollout sequence for each transformer within the game is that it matches the movie counterparts and that you see how each part shifts into position, whether from vehicle to robot mode or robot to vehicle. Bits like how Bumblebee's doors become his back wings or Blackout's rotary blades end up functioning as sharp swords in robot form is the attention to detail I live for. Simple actions such as walking also carry this element as well, taking into account the form factor of said Transformer. Starscream's awkward body frame as a robot means he almost tiptoes everywhere because of how his legs are structured, while Optimus and Megatron barrel towards whatever they're running towards, befitting their leadership role of their sides. This does lead to some unintentional hilarity, as the pre-rendered cutscenes are filled with odd amounts of silence and truly bizarre directing. Mind you, these are some of the funniest things I've seen, so while probably not meant to be a positive, I will take how they are framed as one of the better parts of the game. Words just cannot do them justice, and it feels like they were animated in a vacuum of some eldritch entity that didn't know how Transformers should react. What? That's my car? Oh. I've been cornered. Can you escape without excessive force? That will be a negative. Ironhide, can you lend some support? Sit tight, soldier. I'm on my way.
Sound-wise, Transformers 07 lacks the Linkin Park back soundtrack from the movie and opts for bland, diff, unoffensive orchestral music. Most of it will be drowned out by the various explosions and band of battle, which can potentially blow out your eardrums, making it the weakest part of the presentation. Classic Transformer stings are also lacking, the ever-important Transform sound effect nowhere in the game, and if it was, I couldn't hear it. It's the one thing that should be included in every game under the Transformers umbrella, so for it to be missing feels like the last puzzle piece lost to the ether or stolen by gremlins. At least on the audio front, the cast for the movie make their appearance, a rarity seen as the last time I covered a movie game, neither Ewan or Christensen reprise their lead roles. Here, Peter Cullen and Frank Welker are Optimus and Megatron, and even Shia LaBeouf and Megan Fox step into the booth for some dialogue with their characters. That's a neat little cherry on top, as it typically isn't the case for a lot of movie tie-ins to get the cast to perform a line or two. That said, voice clips do tend to repeat themselves, particularly when strolling around in the open world, and the less I have to say about the camera jerking every time a Transformer takes a step, the better. 07 isn't the worst looking game I've played, nor is it all that special, but the attention to some details does slightly outweigh some of the worser aspects of the game's presentation. Transformers 07 is a third-person action shooting game with some driving nestled in between. These are Transformers, after all. While difficulty isn't selectable, 07 is a bit hard to peg as it varies wildly from mission to mission. Sometimes you're met with a chapter mission that barely requires your higher brain functions to pass, while other times the game ratchets up the bollocks that you're drowning in balls. Harder missions can follow easier ones, and vice versa, leading to an inconsistent playing experience. Basically, what that means is like a number of budget license titles, previous example on the show Cyber Chase rearing its head here, the target audience is troublesome to place. Huh. This adaptation and the source material at least share that confusion. Leaving my savage remarks on the Michael Bay movies aside, while there is no way to select difficulty, there are two campaigns to wallop Transformer ass through. Autobots and Decepticons. Effectively, both sides of the story have the same format and layout. All that changes between the two factions are characters. For our heroic robots, you'll switch between Bumblebee, Jazz, Ironhide, and Optimus Prime. Villains, meanwhile, unless your personal compass aligns with the Decepticons, you frickin' misanthrope, are Blackout, Barricade, Scorponok, Starscream, and Megatron. A split of four to five between the two halves, though you won't be switching characters on the fly like you would other games. This ties back to level structure, so let's get back to that now. Levels are separated into chapters and missions. Chapters and levels are indistinguishable, and I've been using the terms interchangeably. In short, the chapter is the open world area you can explore before tackling any of the missions, which are completed in sequential order. For some chapters, you only play as one Autobot or Decepticon. The first chapter for the Autobot campaign has you stick with Bumblebee, but later chapters might have you play a multitude of characters, usually tagging in during a mission. Best example would be Chapter 2 of the Autobot story, in which you start off as Jazz for the first mission, then switch to Ironhide after completion and then for the next mission, only to be passed off to Optimus for the last set of missions and the open world if you do decide to revisit the chapter. Yes, you can revisit chapters after you finish them, but you can't switch between characters if the missions have you changing perspectives, so that is what the kids say. Lame. While mission control will hand you like an IRS agent to go on to the next mission, you are freely able to explore a chapter's map as each one hides 100 cubes that unlock bonus material when collected, side missions that do the same, and challenges that also do the same. That's all the open worlds offer, thus if you don't feel like wasting time, you can always roll out towards the indicated green mission, as that is the next subsection in the chapter. Completed missions are highlighted in yellow, but there's no reason to replay them. It makes the mini-map kind of useless in the open world, as it tells you where objectives are in the missions. Speaking of, missions are split between chases, where you follow another transformer to a set location, wave-based combat challenges, destruction rampages, 
bosses or some combination of the above. Place your bets on the last of those as every mission is some mixture of racing around to a set location, either fighting drones or a named character. It's hard to throw a dart in this game without landing on something you've done previously, thus making the missions not interesting to cover. O7 is quick to reveal its tricks, and by the time you've done your third wave combat challenge, destroy X buildings, or boss fight mixed in with some sort of chase, the writing's on the wall. Bringing this right round to the characters again, each control the same when looking at them with an overview. Left stick moves, right stick aims the camera and your targeting reticle, X or your equivalent of a PlayStation 2 button is jump or accelerate for most characters, square is your basic combo, triggers for guns, lock on, guard and boost, and circle is grab. On that topic, Transformers can grab most smaller objects like cars, trees, lampposts, etc, but to pick up enemies they have to be knocked down. Guarding allows the ability to counter when hitting the attack button, which provides iframes and damage in the same package, but regular attacks also grant iframes at random intervals. Sometimes as well, guarding doesn't work, but more on this later. Of all the buttons, however, triangle is the most important as that is the transform button. Pressing it whether moving or standing still has your transformer change to vehicle mode, though it is almost always better to transform while moving as you get a bit of extra acceleration which goes both ways as switching back to robot mode while driving or flying gives you a bit of forward movement, sometimes enough to clear smaller gaps. Yet you can't transform while in the air which isn't too noticeable with any of the cars, but Blackout, Starscream, and Megatron fly thus making this an odd choice. Much like how Megatron adopts robot form after flying into anything solid. Additional options the Transformers have while in robot form is that they can scale buildings, albeit extremely slowly, and this is only used in two missions. Climbing is solely dedicated to grabbing cubes in the open world. Combat against Combots takes the shape of mashing square against whatever you're fighting until it stops letting you, or in the majority of situations, throwing an object or whatever you're fighting to open them up so you can mash square only to repeat the process. There are about seven regular enemy types ranging from small and big transformer drones that can be beaten down with regular combos or gunfire if they aren't guarding, interdrawn drones that die like the previous group and can't guard, tow trucks that swing their cables like flails that need a car chucked at them before proceeding to bash their heads in, blockers that can only be exclusively damaged by throws, chargers that are weak to the backdoor slide, and seekers that operate in the same regards as tow trucks. This isn't including the bosses, though they borrow heavily from the standard enemies and are taken out in practically the same way. Outside of the cubes which are needed to open up side activities, the only other pickups are health which spawns in either fixed locations or is dropped from enemies, and the logo heads which also unlock bonus material. You're more likely to fail a mission by not fulfilling its criteria, i.e. running out of time, than running out of health, though the same thing happens within a mission. You have to start it over from the beginning. Mission length can be variable, so let's just say that failure isn't an option. Completing 07 takes you back to the main menu, almost like a sad kid dumped off at summer camp for the third time in a row, realizing he's seen all that the place has to offer. Not even Cybertron offers any excitement as it's a basic wave mission. Novelty can be a selling point whether intentional or not, a factor that Transformers 07 thankfully carries to slightly outweigh some of the cornball design decisions and rough implementation of ideas. Now that I have given away what type of video this is as the left hand is speaking, exploring the open worlds as a Transformer has quite a lot of potential to be amazing. This comes from a very basic level in that, yeah, Transformers are their own transportation. For me, open world games have a specific problem in the shape of making travel boring. Compared to the rest of the experiences, traversing the map feels quarantined off from everything else such as the horseback riding in Ghost of Tsushima, the walking in Fallout, or the parkour in Assassin's Creed. While the downtime of the ride can act as a decompress from a story mission, more 
often than not, I find the distance to be little more than a necessary evil so I can get to more fun stuff. This observation extends to even open world travel that I like. Sleeping Dogs as crotch rockets are some of the best video game motorcycles conceived, but they still fall to the wayside to the greater functions of the gameplay. Because covering large distances in a short span of time is intrinsic to the Transformers due to their vehicular nature, crossing the open worlds of 07 feels more like hitting the streets of Burnout Paradise or Driver San Francisco, and thus the separating barrier is nowhere to be seen. Rock'em Sock'em Robots blends together with Need for Speed in a mentally conceivable way, as all the levels take advantage of both modes in the same ways that Infamous and Prototype would fuse their action and traversal styles two years later. As if to drive this home, the driving or flying feels distinctive between all the Transformers. Bumblebee is an all-rounder, Jazz is speed, while Ironhide and Optimus are mostly power, though between the two, the Prime has better acceleration and feels faster compared to Ironhide's swifter handling. The Flyers fall under the same category as the Ironhide-Optimus differences, with Blackout closer to Ironhide and Megatron Optimus Starscream landing somewhere in the middle of this chart. Scorponok, meanwhile, is the noticeable oddball out of the playable characters because he has unique traversal mechanics. On Solid Land, he only has his scorpion legs to carry him all over the place, but once he clambers onto sand or dirt, he can dive below to quicken his pace, making his first stage in the military base a clever introduction to this ability. It's the only stage with him to take advantage of this, so he swings in roundabouts, but it is at least something, like how the secondary weapons of the Transformers are diverse. While each character does get two guns, what they fire can range from missiles and shotgun blasts, to Gatling guns and grenades, to whatever the hell Blackout fires when in robot mode. While all the characters sand Scorponok share what is in essence the basic combo, I like that their guns expose what role they play for their faction. While Bumblebee is a scout, he does pack some major ordnance compared to Jazz detailing that Bumblebee can hold his own if need be compared to Jazz's weaker machine gun and preference for flight. Nothing would be worse if the Transformers didn't feel their own, so thankfully that isn't playing the game. Much like how all the characters are voiced by their actors from the movie. This hasn't always been the case within the Transformers games, Armada PlayStation 2 is illustrative in this point, but it's always good hearing Peter and Frank as the best friends turned sworn enemies, Optimus Prime and Megatron, and I don't think Shia LaBeouf gives a terrible performance either. Playing the hand is what this is called, as you know I'm in dire straits of why I'm having to call attention to this and not, you know, the gameplay. The story of Sisyphus is often used as an example of displaying infinite tedium, punished to continually push a rather large and weighty boulder up a steep incline only to watch it fall back down to the bottom simply to begin the process anew without rest could be framed as a type of insanity in that Sisyphus is trying something over and over again, expecting different results. It is a hell of his own making since he thought he could outsmart the gods, thus he was rewarded with mindless busy work for the rest of eternity, mocking his rather sharp cleverness. Hubris in a distilled, unadulterated form befitting the likes of Greek mythology where the gods were cruel and often passed judgment in the same vein that humanity did. They were a reflection of us and our own natures. Or, in the great words of one Mr. O.O.C., I don't like repetition. I don't like repetition. I don't like repetition. God, does the game match the movie in this aspect when it comes to the gameplay? What you see is what you get in the truest turn of phrase. Outside of level and chapter progression, there is so little growth within the loop that it makes the deserts of Qatar hospitable. Missions are divided into around three categories. Destroy, chase, and fight. That's it. Regardless of who you are playing as, level structure is absolutely the same, making whole swaths of levels and chapters blend together to a shocking degree. And that's when levels are on the lighter side of unique, such as the case for the cooling fan Hoover Dam mission, as instead of chasing, you're running. To cut down a lot of my own rock pushing, 
The battles against Barricade, Shockwave, Brawl, Bumblebee, and Optimus are the exact same layout-wise. Split into two phases, you alternate between attack and chase where once you've damaged any of the above enough, they begin to run away forcing you to track them down. The only minor deviance from this portion of these bosses is that Barricade slash Bumblebee requires you to beat them in a race to the next leg, Shockwave is trying to destroy the city, and Optimus blocks out the minimap. Minuscule modifiers that don't transform the overall flow of any of the encounters. None of these are phase changes and act more like additional failure scenarios if you don't abide by them. This becomes remarkably apparent in the Barricade Bumblebee showdowns. Sure seems like Revenge of the Fallen borrowed its usage of sound wave scenes with how both battles are exact duplicates of each other. Obvious bashing on one of the worst movies I've ever seen aside, there is literally no difference between Barricade slash Bumblebee 1 and 2. Hey. Not in the contrasting, mind you, between the Autobot and Decepticon, though both the framing of their four fights is the equivalent of a palette swap. Barricade 1 and 2 plays out the exact same way down to throwing an object at him to get Barricade to quit with his flail attack, so you can wail on him, leading to a race sequence back into the flail. Alternate attacks are not employed by the police car to display that this is a later encounter. Barricade 1 and 2, extending to Bumblebee 1 and 2 as well, are copy-pasted. But this hardly scratches the surface of the boss fights, as they are one of the worst aspects of 07, seeing as they require little to no strategy outside of one, which I'll get to, and are usually bogged down by either waves of smaller transformers you have to beat up before the boss can be attacked, or the much maligned, unpredictable iframes that pop up. Straight up, it is sometimes hard to damage any enemy, as it seems like everyone, from these simple drones to even the player characters, gets iframes during attack actions. Countless times I was able to abuse the singular combo each Transformer has because it apparently generates invulnerability, allowing me to bypass through enemy onslaughts unscathed. Other times, the roles would be reversed of me unable to damage a boss because their attacks granted them iframes. Unsurprisingly, this leads most scrapes to turn into a horrible mixture of button mashing and praying, the game honestly matching the dull, disorganized action sequences of the Michael Bay films. If the clutter and mindlessness wasn't enough, in comes the waiting as almighty Allspark. Hard knockdowns happen all the time and punish player and AI alike. No one is safe, we all get thrown in the pit. Enemies who are knocked down can't be shot or swung at. Picking up and throwing the down bot is the singular option you have, but that has its own caveats. Sometimes throws do no damage against bosses as the scripting has given them invuln, throwing doesn't particularly do a lot of damage when you get one off, and you have to hope that if you're wanting to throw someone, you have to reach them before they get up and that no one else hits you while you're dangling a transformer in the military press position. Pin that for later. Meanwhile, getting sent flying from any attack capable of launching the player usually means you have about a 5 second waiting period before you can begin to move again. If that wasn't bad enough, almost every enemy has a move that can casually do this to you, some of which are unblockable, I think. The guard is a fiddly bastard in that it works about half the time. The other, sometimes attacks slip right through, knocking you out of guard and off your feet, or in the strangest case, you'll take damage while still guarding. It's nigh impossible to figure out as the best showing of this conundrum comes from the chargers, as it was about 50-50 if I could block with or without repercussions. Speaking of them, boy does the variety of drones you fight blow harder than your average dating sim harem. Around three are fun to fight, the smaller drones that come in forklifts and civics and the Energon drones. I'm not counting the military or cops as they aren't threatening in the slightest and crumple under a weak breeze. The rest of the antagonizing force will leave you with a bald head and a need to apply some head on. If you haven't guessed what the conjoining factor is, time to pull that pin from earlier. Most need to be opened up by being hit with a thrown object. Tow trucks, seekers, and whatever the blockers are supposed to be are completely invulnerable until anything is chucked their way, leading you down three paths. First up, grabbing objects is ridiculously unintuitive as to pick up anything, you have to be standing in a way that allows you to grab the item without accidentally pushing it away. 
This carries over to any object you can throw, leading to an insufferable time as it's akin to that old dollar bill on a fishing hook routine. Once you're quicker than that, you better not get hit as you drop an object upon contact with damage. By the way, you can't jump or guard while holding an item, and a Transformer's movement speed is reduced to half with two-handed items, so good luck. Connected to this dying tissue like an engorged maggot is that some items blow up. Cars are stringent to this ruling. In the sequence of picking up a car or trying to throw it at an enemy, it can blow up, thus forcing you to restart the process as an exploding car ceases to have collision or a hurt box. Rounding out this terrible trio, said collision can be random. I have perfectly thrown items at tow trucks, only for 07 to not register the hit, bringing me back to the start of this issue. Guess what populates a ton of the ending missions? You fight exclusively tow trucks, blockers, seekers, and chargers, making the four-hour experience stretch to an atrocious crawl. Compounding the problem like a gibberish math equation, the Annoying Quartet have cycles. Throwing a lamp post at a tow truck seeker or blocker grants you a window for your basic attack for the first two or a throw for the blocker, which after they take brings them back to their invincibility phase, thus finishing the circle. In total, two for tow trucks, three for seekers, and around four for blockers. And that's if the game counts anything you've thrown as having collision. Megatron's final stage is woeful as this fetid wave of bullshit greets you like a long-lost uncle who reeks of Pap's blue ribbon during a family reunion. Chargers get their own special mention as opposed to throwing trees at them. You have to play the waiting game to strike them from behind. All this unpleasantness factors into the entire game as most boss fights, nay, most levels, are spent around dealing with cronies before tackling whatever Autobot, Decepticon, or objective you're dealing with, some stricken down with the sickness as well. Barricade Ari has to have a throwable tossed his way to make him vulnerable, but on the flip side, Bumblebee is an enhanced version of the Chargers waiting game, replacing it with an all too boring variant of red light, green light. Hilariously, everyone else gets saddled with either a chase, wave-based fighting, or both leading to the above-mentioned blending of gray slurry. The only standouts are technically Blackout and Starscream as you fight both together, and Megatron as he does some bombing runs before landing, making him the only traditional boss in 07. That technical is because in between Star Out are two Seekers you have to swat down. In relative terms, however, Starscream and Blackout are the worst of the bunch because of how their battle combines every problem disgracing the game together with some new one specific to the duo. On top of the invincibility problem, bosses really love to guard against everything, meaning your regular attacks can be completely nullified, and guns are moot as every boss shrugs off projectiles, sands thrown objects. Regular enemies do this too, but back to Star Out, this factor becomes important to winning once both decide to have a go at Jazz. You can't outrun them in the confined space you have to deal with the two, and leaving it for too long causes a mission failure, so the only way to have a reprieve from their assault is by guard locking them. Without fail, if you shoot at either Starscream or Blackout, they block and stay in it for a few seconds after you stop. Why this is important is that throwing anything at them during this state will hurt the two, as blocking can't negate throwable objects. This also prevents them from retreating and regenerating like one of their listed skills on their character sheet is disengage. While scummy in all intents of the word, this strategy is the only god protecting your sanity, as Starscream and Blackout, if not stunted by gunfire, will sandwich jazz like Piper Perry on the couch. One will inevitably sneak up on you from behind and take pot shots, while the other is mildly annoyed by your attempt to hit him, content in knowing that the game's wanton usage of invuln will protect him, but not you. Meanwhile, every other boss is a case of whole guard and counter. Outside of Bumblebee, you can safely sit behind guard and mash the counter button as bosses are too stupid to not run into it. It's what makes the actual fights hard to cover, as there is so little substance within them, but much of the garbage I've had the displeasure to play through surrounds them. Mission failure is a rabbit punch to your soft squishy bits, as there are no checkpoints. Have fun cutting down wave after wave of tow trucks, chargers, and blockers again.
Dickhead. Forgettable is a prime word for 07, as due to how many mission objectives are reused, it's decidedly difficult to point out anything unique besides the annoying components, which end up tying a lot of the game together in a death knot. Blackout and Starscream share the same first mission. Scorponok's two levels are both destruction fests. Everyone gets some mashup of a chase or wave based fighting, and the only remotely exceptional stage is when the roles are reversed for a chase. Even the elements I slightly enjoy, I have to add a disclaimer and use my left hand. It's neat that the Transformers can explore an open world. There's fuck all to do in it besides collecting boring cubes and playing boring side missions. The driving is pretty alright, until you hit anything and 07's collision wigs out, killing any acceleration you have, which did lead to me failing a few chase missions. The extra paint schemes give us a good bit of nostalgia, but to get them you have to do the stupid challenges and side missions. There's neat bonus material like seeing the models of the Transformers from start to completely rendered, but much of that is placed between screenshots from the movie or promotional material. All this leaves me is the pit of a peach. A few words come to mind. War for Cybertron. Devastation. Call of the Future. All are better Transformers games, whether on a gameplay or fanfare front, and sometimes even both. It's novel that Transformers 07 is an open-world budget game, and that each bot has their own unique attributes, but the utter lack of interesting side activities, the flat line of character progression, and the insidiously bland loop of missions is like the nail of jail delivered to my temple, transfixed in the bad way. Unless you are a massive fan of the property, which again, there are better games under the Transformers license, play literally any other open world game. To provide context, coming out around the same time, whether before or after, as 07 within the same genre was Assassin's Creed 1, Crackdown 1, Elder Scrolls Oblivion, GTA 4, The Witcher, Stalker Shadow of Chernobyl, and the open world masterclass that is Saints Row 2. If you want me to aim lower, there is an argument to be made that the likes of Final Fight Streetwise and Bullet Witch are better than 07 despite equally floundering like Transformers in the open world sphere. Sheer awfulness in the case of Streetwise, and Bullet Witch's creatively flawed nature is better than grey paste. To be blunt, Transformers 07 is akin to the numerous amount of functionally nameless gunmetal colored Decepticons that get torn apart in the Michael Bay continuity, forgettable compared to its peers and offering nothing of substance on its own. In Autobot terms, a real jazz of a video game. <coughs> Requests are 0 for 2 now, as if you remember, State of Emergency was chosen for me by another member of the Inner Circle. That's partly why I don't like doing requests, as it's kind of like firing a shotgun in Hunt Showdown. Sometimes all the pellets hit their mark and you wind up loving the Spectre for its close combat kill potential. Other times, it frustrates you beyond belief as you swear your aim was dead on, but some form of hit recognition and spread decided otherwise. Strange metaphor aside, it basically boils down to me not wanting to have to finagle with some game I've never heard of or only have slight familiarity with just to be met with the equivalent to an anvil on top of my head. Frustration, at least the bad kind in the shape of poor design, isn't something I want to get out of my games. I play for the variety of ethereal reasons not to see my hands be crushed by hammers. Anywho, this show is made possible with the likes of the moviegoers within the peanut gallery and inner circle. Consider buying a ticket at patreon.com forward slash let's talk about games, no apostrophe in the let's, for behind the scenes access to LTA scripts, thumbnails, other bonus material, your name in the credits, and early screenings of episodes, plus the showtime reel.
Woods. As a bit of a consolation for how busy April was for me, May is home to the Gun Grave PlayStation 2 duology on the Showtime Real front. Asses were kicked, indeed. And as always, this showing of Transformers 07 is over, but stay tuned for our next feature involving a creature of my favorite color, jewels that would make Betty proud, and a legacy in the making.